The Amistad. Its name invokes memories of one of the most important moments in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. A moment when all the eyes of the world were suddenly on the small state of Connecticut as they defended the rights of the 53 Africans stolen from their homeland. They freed themselves from those who had enslaved them, but soon found themselves back in chains and at the center of an international firestorm. This is their story. In 1839, 500 African people were kidnapped and sold to slave traders in what is now Sierra Leone. In the port of Lomboco, they were boarded onto the Tacora, a Portuguese ship bound for Havana, Cuba. The voyage would last 10 weeks with up to a third dying from disease, malnutrition, or at the hands of their captors. Some of the most powerful countries in the world, like the United States and Britain, had already abolished the slave trade, but Spain had weaseled their way out of it by not abolishing the slave trade in their own colonies. They also turned a blind eye to the fact that a large number of slaves were seemingly born in Cuba overnight. You see, this is how traders got around the ban, by bringing in captives from places like Sierra Leone into Cuba and declaring them to be born there. Thus, they were legally slaves. Two Spaniards, Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes, bought 53 of the Sierra Leone captives, 49 men, one boy, and three girls, to be boarded onto the Amistad to sell at other ports. Or so they thought. The Amistad was not a slave ship and was ill-prepared for human cargo. Thus, the crew had to place half of the captives below deck and half above deck. Able to move about the ship, they could see the comings and goings of the crew, the location of the weapons, the layout of the ship, and who could actually take them back home. And three days after they left Cuba, their time had come. On July 1st, 1839, the captives obtained a rusty file that proved just enough to saw through their manacles. Once freed from their chains, they armed themselves with cane knives, and from their ragtag group, a leader quickly emerged. His English name is Joseph Sinke, but his African name is Singbe. He would later become their representative during the court proceedings, but his talents were also suited in other areas. Under his command, they attacked the crew, killing most, but saving three men. The two Spaniards that bought them and knew how to navigate back to Africa, and the other man, Antonio, who was the former captain's Creole slave and was good with navigation. Singbe demanded they be returned home, but they were deceived. Ruiz and Montez sailed north, dropping anchor off the east coast of Long Island. It wasn't long before the USS Washington, a revenue cutter, spotted the Amistad and took custody of not only the ship, but everyone on board. All ships and parties involved sailed to the nearby port of New London, Connecticut. But the lieutenant of the USS Washington had other motives. He saw opportunity. He presented officials with a written claim for his property rights under international admiralty law, which included the salvage of the vessel and the Africans. You see, he didn't see people trying to make their way back home. He saw profit. The lieutenant transferred the captured Africans into the custody of the United States District Court for the District of Connecticut, at which time legal proceedings began in New Haven, Connecticut. The Africans were first charged with mutiny and murder, but the court ruled that they lacked jurisdiction owing to the fact that the act took place on a Spanish ship in Spanish waters, and therefore it became a property case. There's a lot to unpack, so let's start with the parties involved. Lieutenant Thomas Gedney filed a libel for the salvage of the vessel Amistad. This includes the African captives. Henry Green and Pelletai Fordnam also filed a libel for the same salvage, saying that they were the ones that discovered the Amistad first. Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes filed a libel for cargo and slaves. The Office of the United States Attorney for the District of Connecticut was representing the Spanish government, and they filed a libel for the cargo, slaves, and the Amistad to be returned to Spain. Antonio Vega, Vice Consul of Spain, filed a libel for the slave Antonio, who said that he was his property. The merchants from Cuba, whose cargo was on the Amistad, also filed a libel. Finally, the Africans, with the help of the Amistad Committee, filed a libel stating they were not property and therefore could not be returned to the Spanish government. To make matters even more confusing, the British government got involved, 
due to their treaty with Spain stating that the slave trade south of the equator was banned. They invoked the Treaty of Ghent, which they had signed with the United States at the end of the War of 1812 and bound them in mutual prohibition of the international slave trade. The British sent Dr. Richard Madden, who served on behalf of the British Commission to suppress African slave trade in Havana, to testify in court. He made a deposition that some 25,000 slaves were brought into Cuba every year, with the wrongful compliance of, and personal profit by, Spanish officials. Dr. Madden, who was acting on the behalf of the British government, refuted Spain's claim that the Amistad captives were born in Cuba. Meanwhile, Spain was actively pushing back against Britain and pressuring the United States as they believed that they had the strongest claim on the Africans. The Spanish were further encouraged that they would win by none other than U.S. Senator John Calhoun and the Senate's Committee of Foreign Relations. On April 15, 1840, they issued a statement announcing complete conformity between the views entertained by the Senate and the arguments argued by the Spanish minister concerning La Amistad. Fun fact, Crazy Eyes Calhoun was actually John Quincy Adams' vice president, though not by choice, which makes for a very interesting twist later on in our story. While all this was occurring, the Africans needed a strong legal defense. In response, the Amistad Committee was formed by abolitionist and merchant Louis Tappan, who also hired Roger Sherman Baldwin to defend the Africans. Professor Josiah Willard Gibbs Sr., a Yale professor, aided the cause and learned to count to ten in the African language, Mendy. With this, he wandered the docks of New York City, counting repeatedly until approached by a 20-year-old sailor and former slave, James Covey, who himself was a native Mendy speaker who was also fluent in English. Finally able to hear the African story for the first time, the Amistad Committee filed charges of false imprisonment, kidnapping, and assault against Ruiz and Montez. In response, they posted bail and fled back to Cuba, which then turned this case from a property case into a criminal case. In court, the committee told the honest truth about how the Africans had come to be in the United States. Meanwhile, President Martin Van Buren was lurking, I'm sorry, working behind the scenes to send the Africans back to Cuba. Before a decision had even been reached, he sent over a schooner to New Haven to send back the captives for fear of his relationship with Spain and his re-election prospects in the South. Unfortunately for him, the judge ruled in favor of the Africans. The rest of the cases were sorted, and the most important thing was that they were free. Justice had prevailed, and Martin Van Buren was thwarted. After all, the executive branch is separate from the judicial branch. Right? Van Buren fired back at the decision, ordering the U.S. Attorney for the District of Connecticut to immediately appeal to the U.S. Circuit Court for Connecticut District to challenge the U.S. District Court's ruling. In April 1840, the U.S. Circuit Court said, Duh! and upheld the U.S. District Court's decision. But of course, the U.S. Attorney was not satisfied and took it to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. Now, before I start talking about the Supreme Court case, I do need to introduce you to one more person. And he was extremely important. His name was John Quincy Adams, or JQA for short. John Quincy Adams was the sixth president of the United States and son of, yes, John Adams, the second president of the United States, who also happens to have been a founding father. His mother was Abigail Adams, who is considered a founding mother, as well as being probably one of the coolest women you've never heard of. Needless to say, JQA had a lot to live up to. Side note, if you are interested in John Adams or Abigail Adams, I highly recommend watching the HBO show John Adams, which I will link down in the description below. It's a story about the founding of the nation, but also about how cool John Adams was. And of course, it does feature JQA. John Quincy Adams is considered to be one of the greatest diplomats in history and would have been considered a successful president had he not been chokeholded by his own Congress, who harbored fears that he was actually an abolitionist. 
They were probably right, and due to his views and the fact he was a successful attorney, he decided to take on the Amistad case. Take that, crazy eyes, Calhoun. On February 23rd, 1841, Attorney General Henry Glippen began the oral argument phase of the prosecution, stating the Africans were actually Cubans as evidenced by the documents provided by the Spanish. Of course, these documents were later proven to be foraged. Baldwin fired back arguing the Spanish government was manipulating the court into obtaining those that had already been freed by the district court. John Quincy Adams gently reminded the court that they were still, in fact, part of the judicial branch, not executive. He also reminded them that a treaty with a foreign power does not take precedence over the U.S. principles of, dare I say, unalienable individual rights. JQA was an excellent orator and would even make subtle flexes to his own founding father. At one point during his eight and a half hour long speech, he pointed to a copy of the Declaration of Independence on the wall and said, I know no law, statute, or constitution, no code, no treaty, except that law, which is forever before the eyes of your honors. He finally rested his case, having presented the true account of the Mendy and the legal implications of the case. On March 2nd, the court retired to consider it. One week later, the Supreme Court made their decision. The ruling declared that the Mendy were unlawfully kidnapped and forcibly and wrongly carried on board a certain vessel. The documents presented by Attorney General Glippen were not evidence of property, but rather fraud on the part of the Spanish government. The Africans were finally free, but the United States government did not need to aid them. However, there were those who felt that they did. Welcome to the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad in Farmington, Connecticut. You wouldn't know it now, but in the 19th century, this was one of the most important abolitionist towns in the United States. This is the First Church of Christ, whose members supported the Africans throughout their stay in this town, and where Sing Bay even gave several speeches. The Africans were welcomed with open arms here, and while money was being raised for them to return home, they created a temporary home here. The men lived in their own home and the children stayed with Farmington families. They attended school, attended church, they had clothing sewn for them by the community, and they practiced their English. And though people thought they had a lot to learn, it appears the Americans were actually the ones who were uneducated. Upon seeing the people of Farmington trying and failing to grow non-native crops like rice, Many who were rice farmers back home took it upon themselves to teach the Farmington farmers. They also grew rice themselves on their own plot of land, staving off the homesickness in small ways. Additionally, they spent time speaking to professors about their language and culture, which at that time was relatively unknown. Their story, along with their personal biographies, was published in a book around that time, and I will link it down in the description below. Finally, in 1842, it was time for their final freedom. It was time to go home. Enough money had been raised and the journey had been arranged, but they weren't traveling alone. Several missionaries decided to start a charitable mission in Sierra Leone with the help of the Africans. But not all Africans were able to return home. Some died in America waiting for their trial. Others died after they were free, like Foon. He drowned while bathing in a basin near this site and was buried along with many abolitionists here in Riverside Cemetery. Today, a headstone, plaque, and marker honor him and his companion's story. When the Africans arrived in Sierra Leone, most were able to return to their families, though some did continue to maintain contact with the mission and with people back in America. Sadly, it is also possible that some went into trading slaves themselves due to the difficult economic situation. However, one of the Africans, a girl named Margu, stayed with the missionaries and eventually went back to the United States. And she even obtained her degree from Oberlin College in Ohio. She became the first African to ever graduate from an American college. Even after the Africans returned home, Spain continued to pester the United States, saying they were owed compensation for the Amistad, cargo, and so-called slaves. Congress tried and failed for many years to pass a resolution for their compensation, and even had the backing of Presidents Polk and Buchanan, but the money failed to manifest. Take that, Spain. 
Now, despite a Steven Spielberg movie in which Jaiman Hunsu gives the performance of his life and was robbed of an Oscar nomination, a literal one-for-one -one replica of the Amistad itself, and countless resources out there for teachers and history heroes alike, this story is still relatively unknown. It has international significance and monumental social themes that should be taught in every classroom. But even more important than that, this is the story of people. This is the story of Singbei, who at the age of 25 became not only a leader, but a symbol of hope to those who needed it most. His portrait remains one of the first and most important depictions of an African in American art. This is also the story of Fuli Wuli and his father, Pai, who proudly told any who would hear of his leopard hunting skills and the leopard skin that hung up in his family hut back in Sierra Leone. And this is the story of Ba'u, who dreamed of having a wife, so his mother made him ten bolts of cloth to give as a dowry to his future bride. This is their story, and it needs to be told. Hey History Heroes! Before I end this video, I wanted to give you a different perspective on the Amistad, because while I am telling you this story, there are others who know much more than I do. So, here is an interview with the senior educator at Discovering Amistad, who owns the Schooner Amistad replica and runs tours and programs to educate people on its story. Enjoy! Yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Jason Hine. I work with Discovering Amistad, and this is the Amistad that we're, we're on right now. I am the senior educator in charge of curriculum development and um, teaching in the classroom. Uh, but I also work here on the boat as a sailor and um, as an onboard educator. Discovering Amistad um, is in charge of, the, of Connecticut's flagship, the Amistad, which is a recreation vessel of the 1830s Amistad. And the mission of Discovering Amistad is to teach the story of the Amistad Rebellion in 1839 and all the events that surround it, but also to get students and the public thinking about um, what that history means to us today um, in terms of, uh, of contemporary issues of racial injustice. But when they came to New London, it was a sensation. I mean, everybody was talking about the story of the Amistad. In the North, also remember that there were many abolitionist newspapers. Uh, that is, news media outlets run completely by opponents of slavery. They picked up on this story and ran with it. So they really helped to promote the story of the Amistad Rebellion. Um, and then, of course, the subsequent uh, trials. So in the Northeast, it was absolutely um, a hotbed issue. And then, of course, because of Spain's involvement, it also became an international story, as many slave uprising stories were of a, of a national interest. Great Britain, in particular, was an abolitionist nation, and they also had an interest in the story. So it certainly brought many countries together in sharing that interest. In terms of the Supreme Court case, it, it changes nothing for the millions of black slaves in America. They continue for another 25 years to be enslaved, you know, until the Civil War begins in 1860 and ends in 1865. That's what's going to change everything, but it's certainly not the Amistad case. What it did serve to do was really bring together abolitionists and, and those that were interested in fighting racial injustice it brought them together and um, really encouraged them and inspired them. I mean, with this win and with the freeing of the Amistad Africans, I think really emboldened them to really continue to move forward and to continue to find ways to support black lives. I think the Amistad story should be taught in all classrooms. One of the reasons is that there's a wealth of information. No other story, I think, was so present in the news media and the newspapers. Um, there were no cameras in 1839, and yet we have a number of images of the Amistad Africans as they were drawn by a local artist. Those are at the Yale archives. Just an, a, an endless amount of primary sources, very rich in content. So it makes it really easy for students to study up on this issue um, and on this story. Another reason I think it should be uh, taught in, in all schools is the lessons on what people can do when they organize. 
And I think uh, in the 1830s, the abolitionists had to organize to rally around this monumental effort to free the Amistad Africans. That level of organization, how they come together and um, bring together all these resources in order to make sure the Amistad Africans receive justice is a, is a really important lesson to learn. And also, the story of how the Amistad Africans, who don't speak any English or Spanish, have to come here and navigate the United States court system is a very unique story. And yet they're still able, in many ways, to really guide that effort, that effort to defend themselves and to, and to seek justice. So I think for, for those and, and other reasons, I, I absolutely think it should be taught in schools. The Amistad story is near and dear to me, and I hope other people think so too. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that interview and, of course, this episode from Time with Tempest. And if you want to learn more hidden history, make sure to subscribe, bang that bell, distribute your delight, and leave your calling card in the comments below because the YouTube algorithm gods demand it. And I wanted to give a huge shout out to Discovering Amistad, who not only let me go on the Amistad itself, but have that amazing interview with the senior educator. I hope that you got something out of it. I hope that you're curious about the story of the Amistad. And if you are, I will leave a link to their website down in the description below so you can check out what they're all about. I highly recommend, if you're in the area, that you check out the Amistad and all it has to offer. And until next time, stay curious, history heroes.